Welcome to this edition of the Your Weekly Dose of Nonprofit Podcast, the podcast that delivers actionable items you can implement at your organization right away. I'm your host, Ephraim Gopin of 1832 Communications. Today, I'm really happy to have with us an expert fundraiser, director, and advocate for social good, Rakesh Lakani. Rakesh, how are you doing today? I'm good, Ephraim. How about you, my friend? I'm doing well. Thank you. Let's introduce you to our listeners, watchers, and readers. Rakesh has over 15 years of experience in the social goods sector. Currently, he's the executive director at Future Possibilities for Kids, a charity supporting children in their middle years in the greater Toronto area in leading community serving projects while building confidence, leadership, and life skills. Prior to this, Rakesh was the director of campaigns at United Way York Region, leading an $8 million annual fundraising campaign. He enjoys spending time with his wife and three sons bike riding, camping, drumming, and skating. He is a work in progress. In today's episode, we're going to discuss creating impactful change. Let's dive right in. Rakesh, you're the executive director of Future Possibilities for Kids. How does your organization define impact and creating change on the ground? It's a great place to start, Ephraim. And thanks for that intro. I never like bios, but it's, uh, it's, it's always weird listening to someone talk about you, but thank you for that great intro. Uh, so we actually just recently revised and tightened up our mission statement. So I'm happy to have it be shared here. One of the first places that it'll be shared like this. So at Future Possibilities for Kids, we are coaching children to believe in themselves and lead community change. So when I, when I speak about FPK, what I, what I like to do is first ask a question. I'll ask you this, if that's okay. Uh, what were you doing when you were 10 years old? Playing wiffle ball outside in the backyard. That sounds about right. I think I was uh, taking up judo and quickly uh, quitting it shortly after that, after I got thrown by a gentleman twice as big as my size uh, in grade five, I think that was. Uh, so then I ask a question, who when you were that age was telling you that your voice matters, that you matter, that you have a duty to be part of larger change in your community? And guess what? You could actually make that happen. Hmm. All right. Small list. I probably have to go back. That's going back a lot of years. have to think about that one. But that's a good question. Well, it's, it's not an unusual reaction that usually in a room for a bunch of people, maybe one or two people in a room of 50 might put up their hand mm -hmm. because for young children in their middle years, they don't always have that. So what we're really doing is uh, getting children involved in making change by um, surrounding them with supportive and encouraging resources. For example, we match them up with an encouraging adult volunteer. They speak once a week on the phone. They build their own confidence, their leadership. And they also we also get demonstrate almost like a bit of a how-to on, on making change. So whether they're organizing a local park cleanup or uh, raising awareness about diverting batteries away from landfills, or organizing a basketball tournament to raise awareness about the environment. There's whatever their goals, their passions are. Um, that's what we're trying to support in, in our programs, and uh, it's quite powerful. It's, okay, I, I like that, and I like the way you uh, phrased it and with the questions you asked me. That was excellent. So now you were talking about creating that change. Your Twitter handle is constant changes. How do you balance the need to follow what we'll call traditional best sector practices with, as you say, the desire to evolve and change? And in fact, can those two go hand in hand? That's a great question. I, I, do, I do think they can go hand in hand, first of all. Um, and yes, change and growth, they're, first of all, they're lifelong journeys. You're never, that's why I say, call myself a work in progress. We're never done, we're never complete. So I do wanna know what's working. I wanna know the science, I wanna know the data, uh, but I also know what can work better. There's a concept that I really subscribe to, uh, and I know that I've seen you do this actually is quite a bit, uh, without maybe calling it this, is called pattern interrupt, where you do something different than people are expecting. They're expecting of your organization, of charities in general, or of you as a person. And because at some point, the things that everyone else is doing just may not stand out anymore. Um, I also want to know if something is truly working from all angles, like are you factoring in, you know, potential harm being caused and, and the focus on sort of equity and, and true community change, are you doing it, doing it at the expense of something else? So this work that we're doing really has to reflect like the outer edges of social change, like leading from the fringe, and because that's where movements have always started. So to me, that means continuously evolving and, and growing with what is going on in the world and actually being at the, at the front end of that. And sometimes that means uh, going in the face of, uh, of best practices uh, to find something even better. And, and of course, as we know, that's where you might face resistance. But to me, that constant changes represents continual change over time and, and you keep going, going in new directions. Fantastic. The idea of not staying stagnant in one place 
and constantly moving forward and trying new things. Big fan. I hope everybody who's listening heard that answer because that's exactly the way you should be running an organization and moving forward constantly. Today's actionable item. Let's talk numbers for a sec. Please share with us three to four data points that you believe nonprofits should be monitoring, which can help them determine if they're creating an impact on people in their community. Yeah, this is really uh, an important uh, question. I have like two sides of, of my answer to this. So, well, the first thing is that measuring community change, it's messy, it, it's complex, it's complicated. There's so many variables and it's definitely uh, gonna be different for each organization. But you do have to make your best effort to, to measure and, and, and gather feedback to ensure that the claims that you're making in your mission statement, in your messages, in your fundraising are actually valid. So uh, while it's not a specific data point, and this might be something that's very basic for those that are in programming or evaluation, but really it's, it's finding multiple opportunities for stakeholders, to, uh, to provide feedback. So for example, you know, pre and post surveys in a program, it sounds so basic and simple. And then taking that information, analyzing it and actually using it to guide your future directions, qualitative and quantitative feedback. So you know, that's gonna be very specific to your org, but I, I, do, I am surprised by how many organizations aren't taking advantage of that. And so that, that leads me to sort of another aspect of this, which is what percentage, and this might be a little harder to, to really um, nail down, but even if it's an, an estimate, what percentage of your organizational direction and programming is community driven? How much is your community influencing? Or are you just making decisions in an ivory tower somewhere and saying, this is what we think the community needs? That is really not how community change works. You really need to evaluate how much you're, you're looking at. Um, so, so for us, for example, we have so many uh, opportunities to provide feedback in multiple ways. And we do sit there and we review everything that's put forward and it really does shape our direction. And I think that to me is a really good indicator that, you, that uh, you're making a difference when you get the responses from all those surveys and you also know that your organization is listening to the community. Um, another piece of that is the, the net promoter score or retention referral. Um, again, not necessarily a measure of impact specifically, but I'd like to believe and we would like to believe that if your program made a difference for someone, whether that is a child or a family or a parent or whoever it is, that they would actually take the effort and energy. They believe in it so much that they would tell someone else about it and whether, or volunteers too, actually. So we're, we're measuring that as well to see. Um, but I think another kind of element of this, which is probably the most interesting one is, uh, I heard about a discussion between a senior person at an organization and, and someone else, and they kept pushing them on the evaluation, pushing them on the evaluation. And this person responded back, how do you measure the impact of a hug? Hmm. And that says to me, like, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying we should not measure. We absolutely need to, to be uh, finding ways to measure our impact. But at some point, we have to know that what we're doing is going to make a difference. And we may not always be able to put a specific number on it. Okay. So I, okay. That last one is, is obviously some, as somebody who loves data, that last one kind of says, not everything is in the numbers. I agree. I like how you frame the rest of it, though, in terms of data points as it affects the community. It's not just how is the organization doing. But what impact are we having on the broader uh, community uh, in, with our services and with our programming? And I like the way you frame that and the way that you as an organization are looking at it from that standpoint. So that's, again, something listeners should listen to. You're not just looking how your organization is being successful, but what you're doing in the community. That's great. Um, there are consultants out there, I know you've heard this, who lament the fact that the nonprofit sector is very rooted in, we've always done it this way. On LinkedIn, you identify yourself as a warrior against apathy. I happen to love that. Do you believe our sector has a problem with wanting to change in a meaningful and lasting manner? And if so, why is there such resistance to that? Yeah, I, I have heard that. And to me, that's like, you know, one of those telltale signs. Let's say you're in an organization or perhaps even a broader sector and you hear things like, you know, that's not my job or that's the way we've always done it. Like these are like, these are actually signs, you know, like when you're thirsty, it's already too late. You've already dehydrated. Like when you hear those things, you've already gone so far down that road of, of just being stuck. And I, I do think though, there are people who, um, who benefit from things not changing. And so th their power and their livelihood depends on that. So of course they're going to say, we can't change because this is, this is my, this is the way I do things. And I get business because uh, of our, our, our charity thrives on, on, on doing things this other way. And you're always going to have people that are trying to preserve the old way of doing things. But I, I see a really big subset of Ryan, of, of large, a large subset of people who are open and vulnerable and trying new things. And that's who I'm trying to watch and learn. I said earlier, sort of leading from the fringes, because that's where movements, you know, that's where they come from. So I, I think that there are some who resist, 
but are also open to learn. So then I'm, I'm hopeful and, and, and that's, that's promising to me. And I include myself there. Like, I don't know everything. And I, sometimes I'm like, oh, are you sure we should be challenging that? But I want to listen and be open. And I just, I do want to believe that everyone is in this space for an ultimately, you know, that goal of long lasting change. Um, but we do, we can't forget that this whole sector is like an offshoot and a product of the same system that created many of these problems in the first place. And sometimes it's hard to remove yourself from that. Okay. I like that answer. Um, so speaking of the sector, you call it the social good sector, not nonprofit. So how do you define social good? And then how does that definition affect how you manage, how you fundraise, and how you build relationships? Right. Well, right off the bat, we're like the only group in society that defines ourselves by like what we are not. That's not my original thought. I wish I could give credit for who said that first, but it's true, not for profit. It's like you're already starting on a negative, right? Yep. And even the word charity has like a bunch of connotations that go with it. You know, people begging for money and like, like we're just, it's just not um, good connotations in terms of like what people think that the charity sector does. And so to me, the idea of social good reflects what we're really doing, which is, you know, a very specific type of contribution. It's, de it's defined to me as pushing society and pulling, I guess, so we're kind of along for the ride uh, towards a place where there is true equity and justice for everyone. We have a long way you know, to go towards that goal and, and many are working towards achieving it in different ways and we do need that. But what this means for how I operate or how I believe we, sh we should operate is that we have to spend a lot of time and energy undoing what is already in place, including what's in our own minds and hearts. It's a lot of unlearning. And it means looking to sort of styles of management and fundraising that also align with this goal. And I think there's there's a lot of, of that is missing right now, that how can we do fundraising, do communications, do our programming in a way that also aligns with that greater goal. And I think that's something that we need to see a little bit more of. Uh, I think I think people really believe that because the mission and program are, are about doing good, that this, this that the means justify the end. And I don't, I don't really, uh, I don't really agree with that. I don't think that they do. So all of our actions have to align with this end game. And sometimes that means making sacrifices or choices that, you know, that may not get made in other industries. Uh, for example, turning down a donation if it's not uh, a fit in terms of, well, this doesn't make sense for us, or uh, turning down a partnership because the head of that organization has been, you know, abusive to your staff. Like these are the, the kinds of things that we've been perpetuating in our own orgs, and we really need to. To, uh, to work on. So that's a long road in terms of the first question about social good, but it's like, we have to embody that in everything that we, we do. Okay, I hope everybody was listening. It's okay to turn down a donation. It's okay to turn down a partnership when it's just not a good fit. And I know that's a hard thing to do as a former CEO. I get it. But when you have to do it for the overall good and for the betterment of, you do it. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's not something people like to talk about, let alone want to do. Um, it's very difficult to do. Let's move on to the lightning round and learn more about you. What got you started on your nonprofit career path? Well, I'm, I'm of the, the, the cohort that was fell into it, I would say. Uh, I was a business education, but then kind of disillusioned with the idea of increasing uh, shareholder value. And so the idea, discovering that you could actually work towards community value was really appealing to me. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's when I sort of discovered this entire world exists and I've been there ever since. Fantastic. If you could shake up one thing in the nonprofit sector, what would it be? I alluded to this before. It's the belief that we are inherently good because of our work. To me, that serves as a blocker for so many of the changes that really do need to happen. And I really don't know how we can you know, reconcile some of the things that are happening in many orgs with, with our desire to do good unless we first acknowledge that it's happening in the first place. That's an interesting, no, but okay, that's an interesting one. It's different than, uh, definitely different than the other answers I've gotten in past podcasts. I like that, uh, I like that thought and, you know, connecting it to what you're doing or trying to do uh, within the sector. Now, your Twitter bio says, and I quote, hot sauce. Is that what your friends call you or do you like, or do you love spicy sauces? Uh, actually, that would be a pretty cool nickname. I wish I could say that my nickname was hot sauce. I'm not that cool. Uh, but I do just love the spice. I think I've actually burned like my taste buds off. So I have to be very careful when making food for my family. So it's not, uh, you know, I'm like, I, it doesn't even register sometimes how hot it is. I don't know if you're in the spices or not, but you know, as, after a while, you can't even taste it anymore. Oh, wow. Okay. I, yeah, I, yes, I'm into spicy food. So uh, I can totally, I'm with you on that one. Um, tell us about one mentor 
who had a positive who had a positive influence on who you are today? Sure, um, I would say that someone who served as a very incredible mentor for me is uh, Christian Meta. Uh, many know him from his great work in bringing important conversations to the forefront around identity and race and background when it comes to philanthropy. I've learned so much from his sort of, I would say, kind leadership, but his amazing ability to take really complex things and move them forward. So some of the things I was talking about earlier, we have people from multiple perspectives and I've sat in rooms with him and I've seen him just sort of get everyone, he listens, he supports, and then ultimately convenes everyone together on that common ground, which is a very, very powerful, like, you know, superhero trait that I would say that, that he has. Um, he's just a rare, rare person in a sector also that I can identify with. Um, didn't always see fundraisers who sort of look like me or let's say a South Asian background. And so I just really love what he's done and uh, continues to do and, and always learning from him. Excellent. Why Toronto or the greater Toronto area? Well, I've kind of lived here like my whole life. So I definitely have roots here, but I would say it's just like this, this um, I can see spending my, the rest of my life here too, but it's just like this hub of, you know, great people doing very interesting eclectic things. There's like a lot of variety and it's like, there's something for everyone. And, and it's, it's, it's also seems to be this, central gathering place for many you know, movements and social good sector type folks too. So it's, it's great for my work, but also for my, my family to be in this area. Excellent. Lastly, we'll turn the tables. You get to ask me a question that I have no clue what's coming. Go ahead. <laughs> Bring now it. the fun, now the fun. Well, actually I did have a question. If you could press a button and everybody in our sector would change one thing that they do, it doesn't have to be a big thing, even a small thing. Like I really, this is like my biggest pet peeve. It really grinds my gears. If you could press a button and just make that go away or make everyone do something, what would that be? See, there's, uh, you know, there's a million things I could answer here, but I'm gonna go with one that I think is common. Everybody would say it, but I, nobody's willing to do it. The button I press is, I want higher salaries across the sector, full stop. The the sector salaries are by studies, one quarter to one third less than the for-profit sector. Women make 27% less than men within that less salary. So you're talking, you've mentioned a couple of times equity. So the first thing is, if I'm talking salaries, women and men, the same, full stop. Second of all, I wanna bump it up. We lose, whether we like it or not, a lot of good people to the for-profit sector. I will admit here in public to whoever's listening and watching, I have told people, get out of the sector, go work in the for-profit sector, make money, and you can volunteer and donate back your time and money to the you know, nonprofit sector. You're underpaid for what you do. You're overworked. My thing is, if you're going to be overworked and stressed out like crazy, make a lot of money. At least you might as well have some money in the bank at the end of the day and not feel like totally burnt out and don't have money for vacation. So I go on the salaries and I, I know that there's so many things in the sector we need to fix, but I really believe that if people were just paid what they're actually worth, I think you'd bring, you'd bring more people, good people into the sector because now the pay is equal. I think you'd retain people more. Fundraisers, you know this, fundraisers change jobs every 18 months. And one of the reasons it's not just burnout, it's they find another job that's paying a little bit more. They're just trying to get a little bit more money. So if we were paying normally, I really think we'd retain better people. We'd bring in more people. And just as a sector, it would be better for everybody. I know that's a very superficial thing to go with because it's money and it's not an ethics or it's not um, a value or something like that. But I'm a bottom line kind of guy. You got to pay people what they're worth. I, well, I know I appreciate that, first of all, Ephraim, and also... Uh, that is an equity issue. It is an ethics issue. It is a. It is a. It is an important one because uh, it speaks to so many things. Because that would require a massive shift in how we view things, how we operate, um, how we treat people of different backgrounds. Because we know there's racism and things like that, and and sexism and all that baked into the processes for hiring and recruitment and, and negotiation and all of that. So there, there, it actually is an equity issue. And to me, paying for value is something that our sector needs to be doing more of. We're always like partly tail between our, first of all, we want to be treated like, treat us like businesses. Don't ask us all these questions and don't be scrutinizing us. And then we come tail between our legs and we're like, can I get that discount? Yeah, I'm like, yep. you just, you can't, you know, I mean, I'm not saying well, it's not going to turn down a charitable discount if it's offered, but we can't be always, we can't have it both ways. We, ha we have to pay for value. So I'm with you. Yes. I like, I like the, yes, I will say the salaries, but the back way is not everything is free. And when you ask for everything to be free, you don't necessarily get the best work possible. So 
I absolutely, 100%. I, I don't know if that's the one button. I just, that was the one that popped into my head simply because you've been talking about change moving forward in equity. And I just know that that's a big, huge issue in the sector uh, in terms of different cultures, different, you know, genders and everything else. It's just across the board. It's a problem and I'd love to see it solved. Will it be solved? I hope so. I'm not, uh, I hope one day I'll be able to see the same salaries offered to CEOs and fundraisers and program staff and administrative staff that they're offered in the for-profit world. And then, you know, then we'll deal with all the other illnesses within our sector that, uh, that we also have to deal with. Uh, Rakesh, thank you very, very much for appearing on the podcast. I encourage everyone to connect with Rakesh on LinkedIn and on Twitter at Constant Changes. It was a pleasure learning from you today. Thank you. It was great to be here. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for, for having me and for, for your responses too. I appreciate it. A pleasure. Have a great day. You too.